Hello and welcome back to part two of this mock run through for business awareness. So in part two, I'll be running through the remaining tasks in the exam. So that's task four through to seven. So let's hop back in at task number four, which is worth 10 marks. And as you can see straight away, it is the next written task that we need to tackle. So let's hop in and make a start. So this task is about ethical and legal compliance. It contains parts A through to B. For this task, an extract of the AAT Code of Professional Ethics is available in the references section to the right. You have been working for Lozano and Co LLP, a firm of accountants, and recently the following circumstances have been noticed with a client. I'm going with Polly Willis Limited on this one. That's the best pronunciation that I can give, I think. Polly Willis Limited wants to have a full review of its financial statements completed before it gets its stock exchange listing. Polly Willis Limited has explained to Lozano and Co LLP that the review must state there are no problems with the accounts to get the listing. You found some major errors in the accounts which overstate the profits of the business. Polly Willis Limited has said it will not change the accounts and if you do not give it the review stating there are no problems with the accounts, then it will replace Lozano & Co LLP with a new accountant. You've discussed the matter with your manager and it has been decided that Lozano & Co LLP will provide the requested unqualified audit report without any further adjustments to the accounts. Part A then says explain the threats arising in the situation above for two marks. So there are two major threats here. So let me just grab the highlighter. So it says that they will replace Lozano and Co LLP with a new accountant. And that's if they don't give them the review stating that there are no problems with the accounts. So the first threat that we have in this situation, and I hope that we know all the principles and threats by now, if you forgot them at all, remember you've got PIPCO for the five ethical principles and you've got ASIF for the five threats that you can use, both of which I've posted onto my Instagram, which you can see breaks down each of those ethical principles and threats. So if you can't remember them for whatever reason, I'm sure you'll have them in the book anyway, but if you hop over to my uh, Instagram, you'll be able to find them on there as well. So the key threat here is an intimidation threat. I think for the vast majority of people, you'd be able to see that they are threatening that if they don't give them this particular review stating that there are no problems, then they will be replaced. I.e., if you don't do this, we're threatening to drop you as our accountants. So the first threat, it says explain threats rising in the situation above. So I would put the first threat would be an intimidation threat. Due to Polly Willis Limited stating that they would drop Lozano and Co. LLP as their accountants. So that will be threat number one. The next one, probably a little bit more subtle, but usually they go hand in hand. Intimidation usually goes with objectivity. Self-interest is another one that often goes with objectivity. You'll find that in most scenarios, objectivity is threatened. So the next threat that would be arising here to the ethical principles would be to objectivity. So to explain that, I would say the objectivity of Lozano and Co LLP is being threatened due to Polly Willis expressing their intention of potentially, if I can spell, moving to another accountant and therefore losing business and possibly damaging to their reputation. So that should cover part I. The next part says, explain the actions which should be taken in response to the ethical issues arising in this situation. 
for three marks. So this really, you need to come at this from two sides. You need to come at this from the firm's perspective and the individual's perspective. So you acting as the firm need to explain what you should be doing and as the individual, if your firm were to not do that, what would you do? So two different sides to this. I would probably go in first with the firm's perspective because that obviously is what you would want to happen first. If the firm deals with it in the correct way, then the chances are as an individual, you will be fine. So let's first tackle it from a firm's perspective. So think about this scenario, what they're stating here. The client has asked you to change figures or to at least provide a report to say that everything is fine when we know that it's not fine. So we're basically giving false information. So we basically need to explain what we need to do in that case. So if Polly Willis, we're not willing to change their figures to the correct values, then the firm would need to resign from acting as Polly Willis accountants. So that is what the firm should do. Now let's think about it from an individual perspective. So you will nearly always get a mark for saying that you would escalate the situation. So what we need to say is this situation would need to be raised with a more senior manager. See, we need to be careful here because it has already been raised with the manager and they've just decided to go with it regardless. So it needs to be raised with a more senior manager. It's no good bringing it back up with the same manager because you've already done that. So it would firstly go to a more senior manager. Now, this is where it, I wouldn't say it gets extreme. That's probably probably a step too far. But often the case will be in this in these sort of scenarios, if it's not resolved, then the suggestion is to resign. So we just need to word that in a somewhat professional manner. If the firm is not able to resolve these issues and continues to represent Polly Willis as their accountants knowingly knowingly providing falsified information you would need to consider resigning from the firm and that's usually the standard procedure in a lot of these questions. It's raise it with a manager. Usually it would be the direct manager. However, it's already been raised with the direct manager. So it's raise it with a manager, try to solve the issue, make sure it's correct. If it's not corrected, then you would look to resign. That is the standard procedure. So they can change the scenario around, but for the most part, that will be what you need to do. So that covers part one on here. Hopefully nothing too bad on that one. So let's move down. So the next question, it says you've been completing your AAT studies at college and you have received a telephone call from one of your classmates asking for your help and advice. They have had a situation develop at work and they are unsure what it means. In the conversation, your classmate explained the following. We have a client who is putting a large amount of cash through his business as sales of second-hand cars without any corresponding purchases of these cars. There is a rumor this client is involved in criminal activities. When you asked whether they had spoke to their manager at work about this, they replied, my manager receives a cash bonus from this client for completing their accounts and said if I just ignore it and get them finalized, I will probably receive the same. Part B then, provide an explanation to cover firstly the offense which arises in this situation, then the action your classmate should take, and then lastly, a consequence of not disclosing the information. Right, well, the offence should be relatively clear here. 
because this stinks of money laundering. So we've got no backup for these secondhand cars. The response from the manager, I think we would describe as shady at least and fraudulent as more than likely. So let's get this down then. As there is no evidence of these cars being purchased, the corresponding sale and cash received from these cars looks to be fraudulent. The act of falsifying the records with sales that do not exist and inputting cash, ooh, if I could spell, inputting cash into the organization would be classed as money laundering. The action your classmate should take then, so as they're referring to them as a client, we can safely assume that this is an accounting practice. Now, if it's an accounting practice, they would have a designated MLRO, which is known as a Money Laundering Reporting Officer. So in the first instance, that is who it should be reported to. So I would say, I would tell my classmate, to report this incident to the firm's money laundering. Don't shorten it, by the way, to MLRO. You might have seen it as that in your books, but do write it out in full. So money laundering reporting officer. So as this is a criminal offence, it would also be reported or potentially reported to the National Crime Agency. So if you didn't work in accountancy practice, it may be, or there's a strong chance that you wouldn't have a designated MLRO, and therefore it would be reported straight to the National Crime Agency. Even if you do have an MLRO, it doesn't mean it's not reported. It just means that the first stage is usually to go through them and they would escalate it. So all I would add here is that the money laundering reporting officer may decide to then take this to the National Crime Agency as the act of money laundering is a criminal offence. And then the last one, it says a consequence of not disclosing the information. So as the accountant, if you were to not disclose this information and then were found out, there are two scenarios that could come up. A, you could actually be criminally prosecuted yourself because you have the responsibility of raising criminal activity within your role. The second is that you could also be disciplined by your professional body, obviously in this case AAT, but if it was any other as well it would so for example ACCA, SEMA, ACA whichever one it would all be the same treatment in terms of if you were to be found negligent or breaking the law in this sense they could remove you from that professional body so I would just put in lastly there may be disciplinary action taken by the professional body which may result in the individual or practice having their license revoked. And I think that covers that question quite nicely. So then the last section says state why they should not speak to the client about it before taking any action to report the behavior. Well, that is known as, and I hope you've seen this within your books, tipping off. The act of speaking to the client before making the report 
is known as tipping off. Obviously, we don't want to do that. It means that the client will then have a chance to try and hide those criminal activities. Tipping off in itself is a criminal offence. So as the accountant, we would definitely not want to do that. Excellent. Right. And that covers task four. So although that is a written question, I think that is relatively nice. You can see that we've not had to write absolutely loads there. We've just made our points for each one because it's been broken down into such small marks for each point it's actually made it even easier to answer because you can see when you've got one or two mark questions, you know straight away that you're only going to have to make one or two points for each of them. So hopefully nothing too challenging there. And we can now move on to task five. So task five is worth 10 marks and is about the microeconomic environment and sustainability. This task contains parts A through to D. Cinef Limited produces a range of tissue products. They have recently undertaken a number of initiatives to number one, reduce the amount of packaging on their products. Number two, improve their processes to recycle water up to 40 times through their production process. And number three, regulate working hours to ensure all staff members have a full lunch break. Part A then for four marks, identify whether the following statements about these initiatives are true or false. Statement one then, these initiatives will result in increased sustainability and are likely to increase overall costs. That would be a definite false. So increasing sustainability, absolutely true. But then the second part, likely to increase costs. Well, point one on here says reduce the amount of packaging on their products. So I don't see why that would be likely to increase overall costs. So that first one would be false. The next one then, production process water recycling is an example of social sustainability. Hmm. So it is a example of sustainability, but it would be environmental rather than social sustainability. Social, it generally falls more around helping such as local community, employing apprentices, promoting from within, etc. That is social sustainability. So that would be false. Third on the list, a reduction in packaging is an example of environmental sustainability. Absolutely true, it would be. So anything that's directly helping the environment, such as reducing packaging, hopefully plastic packaging as well would be even better. That would be classed as environmental sustainability. And then the last one, these initiatives support the need to take a long-term view to meet present generation's needs without compromising those of future generations. That is absolutely true. So that is pretty much word for word taken from the Brundtland report, which lays out sustainability and the initiatives that can be taken. So that would be true. Part B then, identify whether the accountant's duty to protect the identified aspect of sustainability is supported by the action stated for two marks. So one mark for each. The first action then, focus on the reduction of costs by sourcing a cheaper, lower quality raw material for production. And they're saying, is that an aspect of economic sustainability? Absolutely not. So economic sustainability would be more around paying a fair wage, such as the living wage, would be classed as an economic form of sustainability. Paying the taxes on time, etc., that sort of thing, again, would fall under economic. Sourcing cheap materials, it may be right from a business perspective. However, from a sustainability perspective, that would definitely not support economic sustainability. So that would be no. The second one then, ensure policies on recycling and waste are set with suppliers as a standard, as an aspect of environmental sustainability, absolutely. Anything set out to improve the ability to recycle, use less waste would of course relate to environmental sustainability. Something that has been really pushed, particularly I would say over the last five or six years. Next on the list then, there are three products. Product X is a normal good. Product Y is a substitute product for X. Product Z is a complementary product for X. Part C, complete the following statement for two marks. If the price of product Z falls, this will cause, and we've got an increase in demand for product X, a decrease in demand for product X, or no change in the demand for product X. 
So it says product Z is a complementary product for X. So what we're saying there is people would buy product X and then by product Z as a sort of add-on to product X. So if the complementary product were to fall in price, the chances are there will be more people buying product X. Obviously, you can assume that most people would want both product X and Z, but it may be that people only buy product X because they can't afford to buy both. Or you might get some people who want both but can't afford both and therefore don't buy either. So by dropping the product Z price, people are more likely to buy product X knowing that they can also buy product Z. So that would actually cause an increase in demand for product X. And then it says, and the demand curve for product X will, and we've either got shift to the right, shift to the left, or remain the same. So we can straight away get rid of remain the same. Now, when there is an increased demand, when we're looking at supply and demand curves, that would cause the demand curve to shift to the right. So lower demand would shift to the left and increased demand would shift to the right. So as we've said that there'd be an increased demand for product X, that would cause the demand curve to shift to the right. So lastly, part D then, identify which two of the following characteristics determine the market demand for a good for two marks, so one mark for each. So the market demand is looking at how many consumers want to buy your product. Now the actual cost of production would have no effect on that because obviously the cost of production is irrelevant to a consumer. It's how much the price of the product is. They don't care how much it costs you to make it. It's how much they've got to pay for it. So it definitely wouldn't be that one. Scarcity of raw materials, again, they wouldn't be bothered about that would have no effect on the market demand for the good because they want the goods themselves. They don't want the materials that are going into making the goods. We then have income levels, which would definitely determine the market demand for a good. Now, it doesn't correlate in terms of if people have more money, then there is more market demand. It doesn't quite work like that because what happens is depending on the flexibility, i.e. how much spare money people have, certain products will be in higher demand and certain products won't be. So obviously the lower the income is, the demand for more luxury items would drop. However, the more free money people have available, the demand for luxury goods would go up. And those maybe that aren't as luxury would go down because people can afford to buy the more luxury goods. So would it be affected by income levels? Absolutely. Fashion and trends, of course, that would have an effect on market demand. So we know that if a new product comes into fashion, then the market demand is going to soar very, very quickly. When that goes out of fashion, that would then drop very, very quickly. Even to the expense, you know, if we look at the trend, look at trends, for example, think about seasonal, just, just simply from a seasonal perspective, not many people are buying Christmas trees in July. So the market demand would be low. However, equally, we get into December, Christmas trees are going through the roof. However, barbecue sales, all time low. So even from a seasonal perspective, trends will have an impact on the market demand for a particular product. Now we only needed to pick two here, but let's just check this last one. Changes in production technology. Again, it's production. The consumer isn't really bothered how it gets onto the shelf, as long as it gets onto the shelf. So again, that wouldn't have an impact on market demand. So that covers task number five. That was a nice short one that, hopefully nothing too complex we can now move on to task number six. So task six is worth 13 marks and is about communication and visualization of data. And this will also be our third and final written task of the exam. So let's dive in and have a look at the scenario. Moment Cards Limited, owned by Gianni Boyle, is a manufacturer of cards for all occasions. Birthday cards, Christmas cards, anniversary cards, good luck cards, and many more. Gianni set up the business 10 years ago, making handmade cards at home. He now has premises with a production line and employs a production team and a small administration slash sales team. Gianni has always taken sole responsibility for bookkeeping. Until recently, he had always maintained manual bookkeeping records, 
but now he uses a cloud accounting package. You have recently joined the business to support Gianni with the bookkeeping and accounting function. The industry was very competitive, but in November, a big competitor stopped trading. This has meant that Moment Cards Limited have been receiving inquiries and orders from retailers they have not made sales to before. The computerized accounting package has a dashboard of key financial information. And we can see here, we've got information on invoices, so what's overdue and not yet due. We've got sales, which looks like it's budget versus actual, and just first glance, looks like they're doing quite well. We've then got a breakdown of expenses here. So we've got materials, production labor, rent and rates, power, office expenses. We see materials, looks like it takes up the majority. So it looks like they've got the current account balance. They've got a deposit account balance and a cash balance. So it says you've received an email from Gianni. Good morning. As you know, I'm not familiar with the reports from the cloud accounting package and I'm confused about what the dashboard information is telling me and what I should be looking at. I would therefore appreciate your help with explaining a couple of things to me. Number one, what is the purpose of this dashboard? Number two, why do we need to have lots of different charts and diagrams? And number three, what are three key things this information is telling us about the business? I've also received a message from our supplier to ask if we would like free customization for our dashboard. Could you also please let me know one additional piece of information you would recommend to be added to this dashboard to help me decide which products we should focus our production line on. Many thanks for your help, Gianni. And it also states this information can be viewed in the references section to the right so that we don't have to scroll up and down. So part A then, state the purpose of the software dashboard. Okay, so dashboards are quite a useful bit of kit, particularly if you've got senior managers that maybe don't love the finances as much as what we probably do. They're a good way of displaying information in quite a simple way. So state the purpose of the software dashboard. I would say it helps managers view the business performance in an easy to read format. It's only one mark, so we only need to make one point for that one. Moving on to part two, explain why it is useful to have a variety of charts and diagrams displaying financial and business information. So two marks this one, so we want to make two points to make sure that we get both marks. So I would start off, it is important to show a variety of information to the managers of the business. This enables them to make better and more informed decisions by being shown a range of information. It may enable them to spot trends in the data with only seeing part of the information it may be difficult to identify all possible scenarios leading to poor decision making so I've covered off a range of points there. It's probably two, maybe three points within there. I just want to make sure really that I'm covering as much as possible. There's no negative marking, remember, so they can't take marks off. So writing a little bit more than what you need to is never a bad thing. Obviously don't take too long on it because you're under a certain time pressure, but adding a little bit extra on just to make sure you get that extra mark could possibly help. So part three then says using the data in the dashboard, explain three conclusions or concerns about the performance of Moment Cars Limited over the last three months. And this is worth six marks. So we want to be making three points here. The first part of each point will be explaining what the conclusion or concern is. And then the second part to each point will be the impact that that has on Moment Cards. So to be able to do this, we need to go back up to our data 
So let's identify three either concerns or conclusions. So it doesn't have to be something bad, just something that we observe from this information. So the first one for me is actually the one that stood out straight away that I mentioned right at the start. So we can see that the actual sales are much higher than budgeted. So we start off in November. Now in December, we can see that there is a huge variation between these two. Now with it being December and it being a card business, and they, it did say in the description that they produce Christmas cards, I'm thinking that possibly this is why we have such a big variation. However, I'm not sure why that wouldn't be taken care of in the original budget, but that's something that we can comment on. Maybe that's something they do need to do for next year. Maybe they... You can see that they've sort of taken account to some extent because they've got the budget rising, but they've clearly not got it correct. So that would be my first conclusion, that the sales within December are significantly higher than what was budgeted. So let's just scroll down and put this into words. The first conclusion I would draw from this information is that the sales in December are much higher than budgeted. Although this has been taken into account to some extent within the budget, there is clearly a seasonal variation that has not been fully accounted for. In the future, I would advise taking this into account to make sure that there are no inventory issues leading to lack of cards. So that covers the first conclusion. Let's go back up and see what else we've got. So we've covered this one. Let's see. So we've got invoices. So overdue versus not overdue. So the business has just over a quarter of its invoices overdue. I think that's probably worth making a comment on. The reason why I say it's probably worth making a comment on is because that links to the increased sales. So has the increased sales caused an issue with getting the money in from customers. So let's note that down. A concern the business may have is its ability to chase payment. This has been taken from the fact that they currently have over a quarter of outstanding invoices overdue. This would link to the increased sales over what was budgeted. The business may need to look at its credit control procedures going forward. This wouldn't be something that the business would want long term. So that covers a second point. We've done our first and second points now. So our third point, let's scroll back up and have a look at our information. So anything on profit or loss, so income to expenses, that looks good. Probably nothing major to worry about there. Expenses, materials are quite high proportion. However, that is probably to be expected given it's a product-based business. And then on the bank accounts, so this may be a concern because we have a current account balance of minus 3,235. So that's not something that the business would want because we don't want to incur any interest on that overdue balance. So that will be my third point. The last point 
that needs investigating further. would be the overdrawn bank balance. The business needs to make sure that this isn't incurring interest on this amount, which could be costly if not paid off in the short term. Going forward, it would be worth keeping a closer watch on the bank balance to ensure it doesn't go overdrawn. And there we go. So three points there, three points explained. So two marks for each point made, one for the point and one for the explanation. So hopefully nothing too bad there. And we can now move on to the next one. So recommend one additional piece of information, which would be useful for Gianni when making decisions about the products they should make in the next month. So scroll back up. So we've got sales up until January. We've got a profit or loss. We've got a breakdown. Right, so we've got a breakdown. I'll tell you what would be useful. So we've got a breakdown of expenses here, but we've got no breakdown of sales which would have been useful, particularly in this graph, it would have been useful to get a breakdown of sales because has that related strongly to Christmas cards? We're assuming, whereas if we had that data to split between sales types, we would know that that relates, you know, solely to, it won't relate solely to Christmas cards, but how big a proportion of that relates to Christmas cards. So I would say for this, one piece of additional information which would provide value would be a breakdown in the sales figures to show by each product volume and revenue generated by each category. Perfect, only need one point for that because it's only one mark. So scrolling down, at Moment Cars Limited, there has been no communication policy. Staff usually find out about the business performance and plans at a quarterly staff meeting with Gianni, although not all staff are able to attend. The communication policy is to be reviewed and you've been asked for your input. Part B then, identify the most appropriate method of communication for each stakeholder worth two marks, so one mark for each statement. A new customer should receive a copy of Moment Card's terms and conditions, along with the payment terms. The customer should return a signed copy of the documents promptly. So we then need to pick the most appropriate method, whether that be email, telephone, or meeting. So it's definitely not going to be meeting because you might have customers all over the country, so that just wouldn't be practical. A telephone call also wouldn't be suitable, would it? Because you need signed documents, so you wouldn't be able to send those over by telephone. You could fax them, although, you know, times have moved on. So the most appropriate here would be email. And then the next statement, an update on the progress of a new card design is to be distributed to any staff who are interested. Discussion is required. Well, if discussion is required, then it sort of takes away email straight away, which leaves us with telephone and meeting. So this is to staff members. Now it is possible to do this on telephone. The only problem is how would they then see the new card design? I suppose you'd have to email the card design out and then discuss it on the phone, but then it's only for those who are interested. So how would you know who to send it out to in the first place? You'd almost have to take a poll to see who is interested then send it out to those people, then have a telephone call, which would be quite a lengthy process. So I would say meeting for this one, because you could set up a meeting, invite everyone, and then those who are interested would just attend, and then you've got an open forum for discussion. So I would say meeting for that one. So then the last one, the production manager, Phil, holds a face-to-face -face meeting with the production team to talk about how well the business is performing. During the meeting, two members of staff expressed concerns about the number of staff who have left or been absent due to sickness. 
Following the meeting, Phil sends an email to Gianni to see felt the meeting went really well and staff are now motivated. <sighs> Ooh, okay. So we left something out there, haven't we? Because we've got two staff members who are expressing concerns. So part C then, identify which one of the following is the issue arising in the communication process. One mark for the correct answer. So we've got nonverbal signs. I'm not sure how that relates to this at all. We've got omission of relevant information. Well, that certainly seems like a good option considering he's not mentioned about the two staff expressing concerns. I wouldn't say that's left them feeling motivated necessarily. So that one would be a strong contender, but let's check the other two. Overload, well, it doesn't come across as overload. Overload is usually when someone puts far too much information in an email or a catch up, usually there to confuse or hide a particular point or piece of information. So I wouldn't say that it's overload as such, more just maybe not an outright lie, but I suppose as close to it as possible. And then lastly, misunderstanding. I wouldn't say it's a misunderstanding because he was within the meeting and would have had to answer those staff members and try and alleviate their concerns. So again, I wouldn't say it was a misunderstanding between them. So I would say the best one there is a mission of relevant information. Right, so that covers task six. So we can now move on to task seven, which is worth 12 marks and is about risk and big data. If you've managed to get this far, thank you for watching up to this point. You've done very well. I know it's quite a long video this, but I just want to make sure that I am covering everything in detail. And if you do have any questions, obviously just pop them in the comments below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Let's get into this question then. So this task contains parts A through to E. Part A then, identify which department will require the finance department report detailed in the table below for three marks. So we've got overtime hours for operational staff and we've got to choose between senior management team, production department, sales department and HR. So for overtime hours for operational staff, that would be the HR department. So they would need that information because they usually team up with finance to look after payroll. Sometimes it's finance, sometimes it's HR, but HR need to know stuff like pension contributions as well. So for overtime, it would be the HR department. We then have standard production unit cost. So out of those four, I thought this one was fairly obvious. I mean, it says production in literally in the statement. So that would be the production department. Obviously they would like to know how much it costs to produce one unit or should cost to produce one unit. And they'd be able to compare that then to the actual cost when the finance team finally get that information through. And then last on the list then would be cash flow forecast. So the temptation here may be to go with the sales department. However, really from a sales department, they don't really care when the cash comes in. Once they've got the sale, that then passes over to finance and they would then work on getting that money in, usually with some sort of credit control team or person, depending on the size of the organization. However, it would be important to your senior management team. Cash flow in particular is really important for a business to manage because they need to look across the year how much money is coming in for each month and how much is going out. And that way they can then manage, do we have any extra money that we can use to spend on certain maybe expansions or new products? Or just can we use that additional money in a better way than it just being sat there in the bank? Equally, if they've got a month where it's looking like they're going to be low on cash, do we need to take that into account? And for the two months leading up to that, do we need to make sure that we leave extra money in there in order to be able to pay what it is in that month where you're falling short? So that is definitely something that senior management would want to see. Part B then, identify which approach to managing risk would be most appropriate for a chemicals manufacturer where there is a risk of a large fine if any waste contaminates local waterways. So one mark for the correct answer. So we've got transfer the risk to a third party, classic, just bung it off on someone else. That definitely won't be the answer. There are times where you could get help from a third party, but you can't just transfer the risk. Well, certainly not the entire risk. So it definitely won't be that first one. We've got then avoid the production of chemicals. I'm not sure that's feasible considering it's a chemicals manufacturer. That's basically saying just stop your business. So we can ignore that second one as well. 
We've then got reduce the risk by implementing additional operational control procedures. That sounds like something that would certainly help manage the risk, but let's just check this bottom one. Accept the risk and allow for the fine as part of the expected business costs. So you could do that. However, you know, ethically, I'm not sure that's a great idea. From a sustainability perspective as well, also not a great idea. So it would be option number three. The next one then says complete the following statement. The production manager leaving the business to join a competitor is an example of, and we've got strategic risk. Oh, it's definitely not strategic risk. It's a production manager. That, that in theory, that could be uh, different if it was, for instance, a CEO. So just that is important to recognize that it is a production manager. So it's not gonna be a strategic risk, but in part that's because of who is leaving. Like I say, if it was someone right at the top of the organization, that, that could then actually move into strategic risk. But in this example, it would not be. Operational risk, it would that, that would fit perfectly. A production manager is going to be part of those day-to-day -day operations, so it would be an operational risk. Part C then, identify which one of the following is not a characteristic of big data. Oof, right, well, this is one of those memory ones, really. It's not something you can work out. Hopefully you've seen the five Vs of big data within your book. So I think we've got what volume, variety, velocity, I think it's veracity and value, I think is the last one from what I remember. Not something that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. However, I can tell you that definitely out of these four options, the one that is not a characteristic is vast. Just something you need to learn those. Once you've looked over them a few times, I'm sure you won't have a problem remembering them. Remember, if you've got anything like that that you do struggle to remember, once you get into your exam, you've got your paper and you've clicked start, then write it down straight away. And that way, you know that you, if you have a moment and you do forget, you've got them written down right at the start of the exam. So moving down then, a luxury hotel business has a number of hotels around the world. The hotels are either spa hotels or adventure holiday hotels. Sounds like a great business. The hotel collects data from its booking system for all customers, including the adventure activities and spa treatments they book, the length of their stay, and details of any extras purchased whilst at the hotel, including food from the hotel restaurant and hotel shop. The hotel will also use data collected by the hotel industry regulator to understand the market demand in different locations. Data will also be purchased from a specialist company who provides leisure and tourism surveys to a sample of the population using social media platforms. And we do have this information on the references tab on the right hand side. But as you can't see it on my screen, we will just scroll if we need to. So part D, identify whether the following statements are true or false, and we've got one mark for each. The detailed information provided by the data collected by the booking system is most useful for the strategic level within the organization. No, so that would be operational rather than strategic. So that is quite granular information and something that from an operational side, we could look to potentially use to make decisions. However, purely from a strategic perspective, I would say that's too low a level. So I would say that's false. They wouldn't want the detailed information. They'd want the high level information, but not the detail. That's more operational. Statement two then says, one of the drawbacks of using the data collected by the hotel industry regulator is the high volume of data won't allow patterns of behavior to be established. That to me seems like the opposite of that statement. So I'm not sure why that would be a drawback. So high volume of data won't allow patterns of behavior to be established. That would be the exact opposite of that. Having high volume of data would allow patterns of behavior to be established. And it almost cancels out then the anomalies by having that extra data. So that would also be false. And then the last statement, the responses to the surveys will be accurate, reliable information to support decisions about the services to offer at the hotels. See, the problem we've got there is that this survey is going out on a social media platform 
to a sample of the population. But this particular hotel chain are quite niche because it says, from what I remember, yes, yeah, spa hotels and adventure holiday hotels, which are two quite specific niches. So I would say that the responses from the survey, it may be somewhat accurate, but not necessarily tailored to this specific business. So I wouldn't say that you would get the information that you need from these specific hotels. If it was general, sort of more general hotels for holidays, maybe it would be more reliable. But I would say, no, that isn't the most reliable information to use. So part two then, identify which two ways internal big data will support the hotel business. So it's two marks and we need to identify two, so one mark for each. So we've got understanding the customer experience so improvements can be focused. So what we need to think about first is what is big data? We've got a huge amount of data that we can work with. Usually it has to be within a certain time period because it's no good looking at data from 20 years ago because it's no longer relevant. So this is data that the hotel themselves has collected. So they should then be able to use that data to be able to spot trends, identify patterns, support with decision making, and in general, improve the performance of the business. So now that we know that, let's have a look at our four options and see which two would best fit with that description. So we've got understanding the customer experience so improvements can be focused. Yes, absolutely. Spotting trends, using those trends to be able to then provide a better experience. So it would definitely be that one. Gaining a clearer understanding of the competitor's services. Bear in mind this is internal big data. It wouldn't include anything from our competitors and therefore that one would be irrelevant. We then got anticipating hotel capacity to manage staff and other resources effectively. Yes, absolutely, because it comes back to being able to identify using that information, the trends internally, because it says internal big data, that have happened within this particular hotel chain. So that would definitely be an option. Let's just make sure the bottom one isn't correct. So we've got understanding the size of the hotel industry. Again, it says internal big data. So external of the business, it would have absolutely no impact. We wouldn't have that data unless we bought it from an external source. Right then, last on the list, the payroll manager has asked for an additional total to be added to the payroll summary spreadsheet to show the total net pay for all employees in the batch so this can be checked with the system total when the batch is input. Part E, complete the following statement for one mark. The addition of this total will help to ensure the information is, and we need to select from user targeted, complete, timely, and cost effective. So user targeted, I'm not sure how user targeted would come into this at all. I think that's just there as, a, a, as an option that we can discard straight away. So this is about checking that something is correct, isn't it? Because it says to show the total net pay for all employees in the batch. So this can be checked within the system total when the batch is input. So this is basically an additional control process to make sure that the information is all there and accurate. So the next one on the list, complete, that would describe that quite well. But let's check the others. So we've got timely. So bear in mind, we're just adding on the total to the payroll summary sheet. So that wouldn't affect the timing of this production. We then have cost effective. Well, I don't think adding one extra column on would help in terms of being more cost effective in any way, shape or form. So that would be option two, complete. And there we go, task seven complete. So that wraps up part two of this exam run through. I hope you have found this useful. And remember, if you have, drop it a like and subscribe to the channel for more mock run-throughs and other videos with further explanations on detailed topics. Again, hope you've enjoyed this video and best of luck if you've got your exam coming up. I'll catch you in the next video.